Good morning. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to our workshop today on the science and technology of the Casimir effect. As you all know, the Casimir effect is an extraordinarily interesting subject that on one end enables quantum metrology of a very precise kind to be done. On the other end, implicates some important and fundamental issues in science like the cosmological constant, negative energy, um, dark, you know, uh, dark energy, uh, things like that. So it's really an extraordinary, rich and interesting subject. And I'm really looking forward to the to, to talk today. We have a really extraordinary group of speakers who are really the world's leading practitioners. Uh, it's now my pleasure to welcome uh, the Dean of Engineering from Boston University, Dr. Kenneth Luchin. Uh, Dr. Luchin is the Dean of the College of Engineering and Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Boston University. He's published over 150 peer-reviewed journal articles, cited nearly 9,000 times. His research uncovers the mechanisms that cause lung disease and novel methods for diagnosing lung disease. Dean Luchin has advanced the concept of creating style engineer as a foundational principle of engineering education to prepare students for lifelong learning and impact. He has also published op-ed pieces on engineering education and technology transfer in Harvard Business Review, Forbes Magazine, and Business Insider. Dean Luchin. Thank you, David. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you for attending another year of the Material Science Day that's been sponsored by Boston University for many years now. Uh, it's, I wish soon we can come back and all do this in person and live. And it's very close, we're getting close, but your participation today, I think uh, it shows the enthusiasm for this field, material science in general, and of course the theme of today's conference. Thought I'd just give you a little bit of historical perspective of my view on generally on material science and engineering, and then lead up to this theme of this, of this particular day. And when I became Dean over 10 years ago, I met uh, many individual faculty, in fact, almost every faculty in the college individually. And I found out a couple of interesting things. First of all, a huge number, regardless of what department they were in, were intersecting with the field of material science and engineering in one way or another. Uh, there were people working on energy materials, people working on manufacturing materials, green manufacturing materials, materials to exploit in a variety of ways, the, the properties of light, communication materials, electronic materials, of course, biomaterials, my area of bioengineering. And so I was fascinated by this. And I realized uh, also at the time that we didn't have a degree program in material science and engineering. We had uh, uh, many other majors in the college, but not an explicit program and an explicit academic uh, uh, branch in our college. So with a lot of effort, we created a division of material science and engineering with masters and PhD programs. And then given how many people were involved in this field, not just in engineering, but in physics and chemistry, and even at the dental school, we made a conscious effort not to pocket in an individual department, but to create a division with, which cuts across all of the, the departments I mentioned and attracts faculty from all those departments, and which ran these academic programs as well as an intellectual community, drawing in a new cadre of students that wanted to think and act across disciplines. And it's been a huge success from the initial days when New Day Power ran it to when Dave Bishop took it over, it's attracted a tremendous set of new faculty and students. Uh, element, uh, evidence of his success was our, our recent uh, winning of a National Science Foundation uh, ERC in cellular metamaterials by David Bishop as the director. And so we're really uh, uh, engaged in this, in this field, which seems to have an endless frontier of applications in society. Uh, I look at the theme of this workshop, uh, the Casimir Effect, and it's and it's a generation from quantum mechanics and quantum theory. And I have to admit, I still don't fully understand everything about quantum theory and quantum mechanics. It's, pretty, it's a pretty bizarre field uh, for a traditional engineer. Um, but I do understand that it has an opportunity to revolutionize yet again, many different applications in society uh, from quantum computing to quantum communications, quantum sensing, quantum electronics, and so forth. And so other variations or aspects of the field like the Casimir effect uh, can really open up new understandings of phenomena and then translate that knowledge at the nanoscale, molecular scale, in, uh, in ways that can create yet even more materials or just more understanding of how nature works. So I really appreciate all of you participating. I appreciate uh, the, a significant number of you getting together and trying to understand where the field can go and what the applications to knowledge and society will be. And I wish you great luck at, this, uh, at, the, at, the, at the Material Science Day. And I hope to greet you again in person next year. So thank you, David. Thank you, Ken. 
It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Ricardo Decca. Ricardo Decca is a professor of physics and chair of the Department of Physics at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, in Indiana. He received his licentura and PhD degrees in physics at the Instituto Balsiera in Bariloche, Argentina, a place I've visited many, many times, really one of the most uh, stunningly beautiful places on the planet. Um, part of uh, Professor Decker's research focuses in using classical and quantum oscillators to produce precision measurements of fundamental interactions. His work in this area has led to his election as a fellow of the American Physical Society. Professor Decker, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, David, and thank you also, David Campbell, for, for putting this together and everybody else uh, behind the scene uh, making this happen. Um, let me just start sharing my, my screen now. Oops. Okay. All right. Um, so what I what I will be talking about is uh, some measurements. I'm an experimentalist, and uh, I'll be talking about measurements we have been doing, uh, precision measurements of the capsimeter interaction um, between a gold sphere and a gold plate, and uh, Broadly speaking, what we have learned and uh, what we still need to learn. And um, what you can see here is uh, many of you are quite familiar with this. This is a microelectromechanical oscillator. So it's a polysilicon plate, which is color blue in here. Uh, it's a torsional oscillator. These uh, golden springs, uh, false color golden springs, uh, hold them in place. And this can oscillate, uh, can oscillate along this torsional axis and the maroon uh, 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 plates underneath are electrodes that by measuring the capacitance, then we can measure how, how much it has tilted. And this is basically our transducer, the transducer that we, we use in order to say how much it has tilted due to some interaction. And that is how we measure the interaction. And that is uh, basically what we will be using uh, the whole time in our, uh, in our measurements. So, Before I, I get started with my uh, with my talk, uh, I, I want to acknowledge my collaborators: um, Daniel Lopez, uh, currently at Penn State University; David uh, Saplewski uh, at Argonne National Lab; particular Vladimir Mostepanenko and Galina Klimskaya, Pulkovo Observatory, and Peter the Great at Saint Petersburg Polytechnic University of Russia. And Galina is is taking place in this workshop, and she will be presenting a talk later. Same goes with Giuseppe Bimonte. Uh, he also will be part of the workshop, and he's at the Università di Napoli, Federico II in Italy. Paolo Americo Mayaneto uh, at the University Federal de Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Gerd Ludwig Ingel at Augsburg in uh, Germany, and Benjamin Spreng currently at the University of California Davis in the USA. And my group, or part of my group here, Thomas uh, Muchuan and Patrick, which actually make the uh, some of these measurements possible, and uh, the funding agencies are at the bottom. <clears throat> I want to use the beautiful picture that uh, is part of the um, part of the um, uh, advertisement and, and promotion of this workshop. So basically, what we have here is a, a finite plate um, in front of the sphere. Uh, when Casimir uh, developed uh, this, uh, the, the theory for this Casimir effect, what he had in mind is just two plates, two parallel plates made out of a, of a perfect conductor. And what you can see in here is just uh, the modes, uh, the electromagnetic modes that are supported by this cavity. In this case, it's, uh, it's an open cavity. It's made by a sphere and a plate. But uh, there are uh, electromagnetic modes which are supported. And even at zero temperature, they, they produce uh, an energy Interesting thing of, about this energy, of course, the first thing we, we learn is that this energy is infinite. And mm -hmm. some, of those, some of those effects are associated with that, what David mentioned at the beginning, associated with the cosmological constant and uh, uh, pot potentially explaining part of the dark, uh, dark energy that we observe. But in any case, uh, experimentally in the lab, what we are interested in is uh, not in the value of the energy itself, but then when we move the sphere from one position to the other one, those changes in energies are very well defined. And that is what we measure because those changes in energy, what they produce is an interaction. <clears throat> and this interaction in this particular case 
uh, that we are showing in there, or is uh, depicted in that uh, in that schematic, uh, in which we have uh, two two metals and then uh, a vacuum in the middle. That interaction is uh, is uh, is attractive. But then the some interesting things, and that, that has been known for quite some time, all right, uh, since uh, 48, uh, when Casimir did his seminal work. Uh, then it was measured, and then the, the, the precision of the measurements improved towards the end of the millennium and at the beginning of this millennium in such a way that uh, in order to get a better agreement between the, the, the data and the calculations, uh, we had to include finite temperature effects and also particularly the effects that the materials were not perfect, but they had a, a, a particular dielectric uh, function, and in some cases, a uh, 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 magnetic permittivity. As I said, uh, as it was in the title of my talk, I will be talking about gold, in which case we can completely disregard the magnetic effect and uh, just concentrate in the, in the changes in dielectric uh, function as a function of, uh, of frequency. One thing that um, I will be um, showing at some point, and um, many of you are well aware, is that when you consider these, uh, the, the properties of the material, of course, you can measure the properties of the material, but then you don't know what, what happens at, at zero frequencies, uh, which is particularly important when we do the, the, the temperature dependence, because in order to take into account the temperature dependence, first is uh, a weak rotation is made, so frequencies are turned into uh, imaginary frequencies, and then the effects of temperature is, is done that uh, the, 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 the effects of uh, the frequencies are calculated as a set of finite frequencies, which are the Matsubara frequencies, one of them being at zero frequency. In order to calculate these effects, we need to know what is the response of the material at zero frequency, which of course we cannot directly measure. We can measure the extrapolation to zero frequency, but not exactly zero frequency. And you will say that, well, what we should be doing is uh, <coughs> use uh, whatever we know at the lowest frequency and extrapolate from that point, just taking into account that our material is dissipative. And then it will, it will uh, diverge at zero frequency as one of over omega. And I will call this a Drude uh, model. Uh, so a dissipated model that diverges as one over omega when omega goes to zero. And uh, Galina and uh, Vladimir uh, uh, published a paper a couple of years back, <coughs> in which in here, what you can see in the top panel is uh, the pressure. So the, the force per unit area between two parallel plates uh, multiply uh, by uh, the, uh, the cube of the separation. A is the separation between the plates uh, as a function of the separation. And this separation is given in microns. And you see that if used in blue here will be the, uh, this uh, thing that I'm calling the Drude model. At the top in red will be what I call the plasma model. So this will be <coughs> a very similar dependence as the Drude model in which the dissipative term has been made equals to zero. So it diverges as one over omega square. And there is another model that they introduced uh, in which uh, is the, the main contribution of that paper because what they say is that if we made the, the, the dissipation spatially non-local, then the response that we'll, we'll get for the, for the interaction between these two, these two bodies will be very, very close to the plasma. Less attractive than what we'll obtain with the plasma, but very close to the, to the plasma. Uh, the, on the top panel is the range between one and three microns. The bottom panel is the range between three and seven microns. And in the instance, what they plot is uh, what happens if you normalize that pressure, the plasma pressure divided by the Drude pressure, or this alternative spatially non-local Drude pressure divided by the Drude pressure. We can still see that these two remain reasonably close, although a large separations, the, uh, if we, instead of plotting these multiply by a cube, we multiply, uh, we plot directly the pressure. You see that there are some differences, but the differences are are actually uh, um, significant when they are normalized, but they are small in absolute terms. And this will become important later on. Another thing that is very, very important, and it was striking, at least for me, the first time as a neophyte uh, some 20 years ago that I was uh, getting my feet wet on, uh, on trying to understand this uh, phenomena, is that at high, at high separations, uh, the, the temperature effects become uh, important, 
And then the difference between the plasma and the through the prediction uh, are about a factor of two. So, <clears throat> Uh, so why 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 to do this separation? Well, as I as I, as I mentioned before, um, the the um, the <clears throat> there is a strong temperature, uh, a strong separation dependence, and also furthermore, what we measure is between a sphere and a plane, not between two planes, and using what is called the proximity. Uh, force approximation, that means that we have a larger sphere in close, close to a plane. This looks almost like a plane plane separation. So it can be shown that the force between a sphere and a plane is proportional to the energy between two planes at the same separation. <clears throat> the energy between two planes at the same separation varies as one over the separation Q. And so it has a strong uh, separation dependence. And that in a, in a sense is, is a little bit of a problem because it provides an, an uh, or it's a it's an issue when you want to actually uh, do um, the, the 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 measurement at very many different uh, uh, length scales. For example, what we see here on the left is the measurement done by Lamoureux group uh, of the force <coughs> as a function of the separation, and they were able to measure between 0.7 microns uh, up up to eight microns. On the right-hand panel are part of my results, as uh, shown in here are between 300 and 400 nanometers. And one fair question to ask is, why are there not results that show the full range? Because <clears throat> what Lamoro measured are large separations, and this red curve here is after the subtraction of a background uh, pro uh, produced by, uh, uh, by patch effects uh, by the um, uh, different different um, um, potentials on the, on the surface between the, the two gold surface, after subtracting this, that red curve, this red curve is a fit using the through the model. So the dissipative, uh, uh, the dissipative model. On the other hand, in my measurements here at the bottom, there are crosses that show the, the experimental data and superimposed with that is the calculation with no fitting parameters using the plasma model and on top is there is a there is a, um, <clears throat> another curve which is basically what the through the model will predict. So there is a contradiction between these two, at two different scales. We see that at, at short separation it looks like the plasma agrees better with the data. At large separations it looks like the through that agrees better with the data. In the table here, I'm showing what the issues are. The dependence is so strong that the at, at, at separation of uh, 100 nanometers, the interaction between Lamoureux sphere and the plane will be 800 nanonewtons, and actually a significantly large force at one micron is 800 piconewtons, and at 10 micron is 800 femtonewtons, still measurable for, for this very large sphere. <clears throat> for the case of my setup, in which the radius of the sphere is 150 microns, the forces are much more modest, of course, and uh, what happens is that at 100 nanometers is 0.4 nanonewtons, uh, easy force to measure. At one micron is 0.4 piconewtons, not so easy to measure. And at 10, a 10 micron separation is 0.4 femtonewtons, is almost impossible to measure with our setup if we want to do a continuous force. But my question at the time was, well, can I use a differential approach? Instead of measuring a force, can I measure the difference between two forces? And that is the experiment I will be telling you about. So <clears throat> the experimental setup that we use then is uh, uh, attached to this uh, uh, microelectromechanical oscillator. We have, we have a, a, a 150 micron sphere glued to it covered with gold. And then we have a rotating disc. This disc is made out of silicon in which we carve deep trenches and we cover all that with, uh, with gold. So now what we do is we rotate this plate and, uh, <coughs> and the rotation of the, of the plate makes the apex of the sphere to be on top of a deep trench or on top of a region with gold. 
the trench is deep enough, <coughs> is on the order of uh, 50 microns or more, in such a way that the Casimir force coming from the bottom of the trench is very, very small, and we consider that to be zero. So when the sphere is on top of the trench, we consider that force to be zero. And when it's on top of the goal, we consider that to be the Casimir force that we might want to measure. Casimir force plus whatever else that might be present. In the bottom left panel here, what you can see <coughs> is the resonance of the, of the oscillator with the sphere glue. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm, I'm having a, I had a bad cold and uh, excuse me for my voice. Um, and and the, the red, uh, the red is, uh, is uh, um, the response of the system, the calculated response of the system, taking into account also the electronic response. That is what you don't see at, at high, at high frequencies, uh, the, 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 the natural response of just the oscillator. This takes into account also that the, the electronic use and so forth, so, uh, so on and so forth, that gives back to a quasi-white uh, noise response that extends to high frequencies up to about 20,000 kilohertz or so. With this response, when we measure at resonance, we can calculate that the, the minimum, uh, minimal, um, uh, the minimal dictational force is on the return femtonewtons per square root of curves at resonance. Of course, if we if this was just the response of an oscillator, this will be the response throughout. Since we have to take into account the, the, the electronic and environmental contributions, uh, if we move away from resonance, the sensitivity will be decreased. So then this gives us uh, another, another thing that we need to do when we do our measurements. When we measure this differential force between the sphere and the trenches, what we have to do is we have to make sure that this response that will be no Casimir force, Casimir force, no Casimir force, Casimir force, as this, this rotates, has to be at the resonant frequency of the oscillator. In order to do that, we created a mask that you can see here. <coughs> In this mask, what you can see is uh, <coughs> different sectors starting from, from in the inside, 50 sectors with trenches and 50 without trenches, they have the, 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 the same, uh, the same um, angular uh, uh, span. In the next, well, then there, we, there is a gap as, as depicted here in the, in the schematic. There is a gap. The, the region with uh, trenches is 200 microns in width. The gap is uh, the gap in which uh, there are no trenches is 150 microns in width. Then there is another region with trenches, which has, instead of 50, 75, another region with no trenches, then 100 trenches, and so on and so forth. Up to the end, in which we have 300 trenches uh, uh, going around um, uh, us. And then we'll put the, the sphere. Actually, all the measurements I'm going to be showing in this talk are on the outer uh, rim uh, that has 300 uh, trenches and 300 non trenches uh, associated with it. <clears throat> to make the sample, we use a uh, 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 deep reactive ion etching, and we deep we make a, 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 a trench which is uh, for the samples I will be discussing is uh, 50 uh, about uh, 50 microns uh, deep, and uh, this is not my picture. This has uh, been uh, been uh, is, is is shown from the, the reference in there, uh, but basically we can get uh, we can get walls with a structure on the side. But we can get walls that uh, are um, very high aspect ratio, very, very, very deep, and uh, and they have uh, a, an angle of about 90 degrees. Uh, when I say that this can be done, of course, this means that uh, a student has to spend a lot of time trying to get this structure. So this is how we made it, the, the 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 trenches, and then what we do is we remove the photoresist, and then we cover everything with uh, with gold. So now the disk is rotated at a frequency which is not the resonant frequency of the of the disk of the of the um, uh, oscillator is the resonant frequency of the oscillator divided by n times m. N is the number of trenches, and m is uh, uh, is the harmonic we want to measure the harmonic of the signal associated with the with the uh, with the 
uh, the, the, the sphere going over this uh, trench, no trench, trench, no trench. In the very simplistic model, this, uh, this will basically be uh, a signal, which is uh, the full signal when the, when the sphere is on top of the no trench region to, and going directly to zero when the sphere is on the trench. So it will be a heavy side a function and that heavy side function, we have different harmonics. So our approach allow us to measure some of these harmonics. We do an electrostatic calibration. Uh, the full electrostatic calibration is performed in a region with no trenches. Uh, and the, the calibration is performed with the system both stationary or turning, and the results turn to be indistinguishable. Uh, we also do a calibration in the sense that we apply a potential difference between the the, the, the plate and the sphere, and we measure this response. We are looking for uh, this uh, heavy side function when this, uh, when this uh, uh, electrostatic interaction is, is, is turned on. Now, to do the measurement is themselves, what we do is we minimize this, uh, this electrostatic uh, interaction by applying a potential differences between the, 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 the sphere and the plate such that this electrostatic interaction is minimized. And we know that we have a kick. And uh, this, this play, unfortunately, has a, a kick, uh, an angular kick, impulsive kick, every, every turn on the order of 10 to the minus 7 radians. And we minimize that by actually making coincide with one of the trenches. So there is a very little <coughs> change in the separation between the sphere and, the, and the, what will be the surface of the plate, but that that very small separation has a very, very small width in, in angle uh, as with these, uh, these, uh, these, these rotates, and it is all contained within one of the trenches, which we are claiming that that force is our zero. <clears throat> Not at all position, but at a few positions, we actually measure up to 21st harmonic of the force. Uh, and, uh, and from that, um, and from that, uh, we, we are able to measure these 21st harmonics of this response. All right. So for example, here are our coefficients of the sine Fourier series. And you can see, and, and I will analyze this a little bit later, uh, uh, a little bit later in more detail. This data was acquired at one micron separation. And, uh, and Bm are the coefficients that vary pretty much as one over m for odd and within the noise for even. And as I said before, this will be better analyzed later on. And here, what I'm showing you are all the results where we did it at each separation. Uh, we took uh, uh, 30, uh, 30 measurements and what we are plotting here are all 30 measurements at all separations at to a separations of about uh, six microns. We went a little bit higher in separation. I will show that data later on. <clears throat> in the in the main plot, the the force is measured as a fun, uh, as a function of separation, but the force is in a logarithmic scale at larger separations up to eight microns. Uh, this this is uh, is measured as a, as a function of the uh, sorry in a linear scale itself. And uh, in the main plot, this uh, this force is the magnitude of the force. In the inset, this uh, is for is shown as a negative force, meaning it is an, actually an attractive force. And you can see, of course, as the force goes to 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 a very small magnitude, some of the measurements I do actually when I when I when I calculate uh, when I set up all the all the turn all the experimental knobs, I measure a force which is actually repulsive, just meaning within the the noise and the dispersion I have for a, this very small force that I'm measuring, which is on the order of a few femtonewtons. Of course, with the, with the experimental noise, some of that will result as a small uh, repulsive force. <clears throat> so what I'm plotting here, or what I'm uh, showing here is that this calculation is due by Giuseppe Bimonti. He did a very nice analysis. This is as the, as the sample, as the sample as the, this rotates, so I'm plotting the force as a function of the as a function of the angle, which this angle is just omega uh, of rotation times the times the time, and this is done in such a way that I try to set uh, the zero angle as it is plotted in here uh, 
at, right at the interface between um, um, between the a trench and, and a region in which there is solid or or the 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 part with no trench, and this is done optically. So there is done uh, some some uh, misalignment that it, that it could go in there, but uh, we have a pretty good confidence that we we get an alignment on the order of ten to the minus four radians there or so. Now, <laughs> this force, uh, first of all, it has parts which are um, even and parts which are odd um, associated with the, this angle uh, this angle phi. And furthermore, it has cosine dependencies and sine dependencies, a full Fourier, Fourier expression. Now, a few things to take into account. The main dominant term are the odd signs. As I showed before, these are the ones in here that have the component of the force. <clears throat> this, uh, there is also a little f in here, and what little f is telling us is, is there any contribution from the edges? Those contributions from edges will be uh, embedded in this uh, force, little force f. And this little force f, f0, f1, f2, are the moments of this distribution. The coefficients or even signs are proportional to the phase shift. So if I did a good job adjusting this, this phase, the coefficients of even signs should basically be zero. If not, they will be proportional to this, uh, <coughs> to this, um, um, uh, to this uh, discrepancy in the, in the phase, and they will be proportional to the first moment of the, of the edge correction and linear on the order of the, of the harmonic. The coefficients of even cosine depend on moments of the edge correction. It is uh, here and depends on the first moment uh, without a dependence on the, on the order and depends on the second moment with a dependence, uh, quadratic dependence on the order. <clears throat> and the, finally, the coefficients of odd cosines are proportional to the phase shift and independent um, on the order. He, this can be, can be seen here. Um, all right, let's move on to the results. Um, uh, does this work, that this analysis using the different harmonics work? Well, here basically in the top left panel, you have the, the dependence with the, <coughs> with the um, odd signs uh, dependence, and then you have a fit, and that fit is basically with the expression that I gave before, and I, I could show the residuals, but it would be too much information. Trust me here in telling you that this agreement is actually an excellent agreement with the model that Giuseppe show. Same thing in here, we have the dependence of the even cosines, and it is uh, <coughs> uh, pretty much constant, but with a small dependence with the order, quadratic depends with the order. Furthermore, <coughs> the the uh, odd cosines are pretty much constant within the noise that we observe and uh, proportional to the phase, independent of the order. And then what we use is we extracted this uh, phase dependence to actually explain what should be the dependence of the uh, even signs. And here what we see is not a fit, it's just extracting the phase from previous, previous data and see if it agrees. And again, the agreement is reasonably good. This, <laughs> gave us an idea of what were these orders of this correction by the edges. And the corrections are small. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say that from what goes on from now on, I'm disregarding these edge corrections and really assuming that this force that we measure is all the experimental force. And for this particular separation at 200 nanometers, this force is on the order of uh, 35 piconewtons and it is attractive. An analysis of the uh, experimental errors uh, in pink in here or in magenta in here is the total errors, which is comes from a contribution of systematic errors and random errors. I have to say a note here about the systematic errors are small separations. In order to be able to do these, uh, these measurements, I said at the beginning I had to put the frequency in resonance. That is actually not completely correct. A small separations, the force is strong enough that is I actually excite this, uh, this oscillator with uh, this very strong force 
right a resonance, I actually will break the oscillator. So what I have to do is actually have to detune the uh, detune the the force, um, uh, detune the frequency from resonance, and that gives some experimental errors and increase on the systematic on the systematic error on the force. So the distribution that we measure for all 30, 30 forces is not normal always. So Galina and Vladimir uh, use uh, an analysis which instead of using normal distribution, we use uh, they use a mean uh, 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 expression for the force in which what we are reporting as the experimental force <coughs> is one half of the force in the 15th measurement and the 16th measurement uh, of the 30 measurements we did. and and. Uh, <clears throat> the, the variance or the error on this force at a given confidence level is given by a, a given, uh, a given uh, a point in the distribution and then I and, and J are these indices that are plotting here. So this was the 10th the uh, measurement, the 10th uh, uh, um, highest uh, uh, attractive force and the 20, 21st measurement, which is one of the lowest attractive force in the position we 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 make a cross uh, that is the the measurement of the force that we uh, that uh, at, at the position that we determine minus the error in the position and plus the error in the position but then the cross is not just the force that we measure we know that there is an extra uh, uh, attractive force that could be due to patches and we do calculate those patches because we do measure, we do Kelvin probe microscopy in our measurements. And from that, we do get an estimate of this patch force. So coming back to the end of, uh, of, our, of my talk, <coughs> what we have here is the measurements with the crosses. Here we can see the points uh, of, the, of the measurements. <coughs> and what we can see is in blue, uh, the plasma prescription, what we will give, and this is a different separations between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4, 0 0.5 and one micron, one micron and three, and at the bottom right will be between three and eight microns. <coughs> we see that there, there is good agreement between the plasma prescription, and in the whole range, there is not very good agreement until you go into large separations in which they actually, the experimental data will agree with either the non-dissipative or the dissipative uh, um, uh, contributions. We need. I need to make here a claim that, or <coughs> I had to make a note here <coughs> that in order to be agree, there will be there will be agreement between the data and the plasma prescription when we take into account the patches. But we even with the patches, there is not agreement with the through the prescription. You can also see that there is a dash curve in here. And this dash curve, which also can see on the top right panel, is the proximity force approximation. The plasma prescription is actually calculated using the full uh, reflection coefficients approach uh, developed by Gerd and, uh, and, and Paolo. Uh, and there is very, very little discrepancy as short separations between plasma, uh, between the full approach and uh, proximity force approximation. Although as large separation, you could see that there is a, dis a, a discrepancy between the calculations, but we cannot resolve it experimentally. Well, Carter, would, uh, would you need to wrap up, please? I'm sorry? Uh, yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry, I've I, I gone a, a little bit over time, but we have developed a new technique that allows to measure the Casimir interaction between 0.2 and about eight microns. It has to be taken with using this approach uh, from edges uh, from the electrostatic si uh, signal, but we found that they, they were not uh, uh, significant. And a large separation patches cannot be ruled out, or in other words, they had to be taken into account in order to, uh, to explain uh, the discrepancy between the full the prescription from uh, the, 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 the Casimir uh, calculations and our data. And there is a good agreement between plasma and also non-local druid, but we cannot distinguish between them with these measurements and data in the whole range. And with that one, I, I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you.
questions. We have five minutes for questions. Uh, let's see. I think the questions will be typed. We have to be typed into the chat. Is that correct? I'm Actually, Q and A, Q and A, Dave. <clears throat> it's at the bottom. There's a Q and A. Ruth says that. Down. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, no open questions. So let me ask the technical question. How did you rotate the plate in a way that didn't have wobble or didn't have shift? Uh, well <laughs> We actually characterize the, uh, the 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 system itself is is a is an air bearing system with a with a brushless uh, motor in which we can adjust the 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 frequency of the rotation in our in our um, in our rotation uh, and feedback that frequency in order to be always at, at resonance. Um, the rotation itself wasn't the the main problem. We also measure. What is the wobble? I didn't have time to, to show in here what the wobble is. And actually, <clears throat> for the measurements I show, uh, we know what the wobble is. And actually, we move the sphere up and down to try to keep the separation constant as the plate rotates, because we know what that, uh, a combination of things. We cannot distinguish if it is wobble or just the surface itself that it is not perfectly flat. Just to give you an idea, these changes in height uh, of the plate as it moves uh, in front of the sphere around the order of five nanometers. But we try to adjust for that uh, up and down with uh, uh, moving the sphere up and down. The main problem wasn't that. The main problem was to, inter, uh, to make sure that we can integrate this into uh, a high vacuum system. So we had to, to make a system that allows us to go from uh, an air bearing uh, that actually generates a lot of air to 10 to the minus seven tor uh, in, in the chamber. Terrific, thank you. Other questions? Amazing work, beautiful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. So next, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Hoban Chan. Uh, Professor Chan obtained his PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1999. He was a postdoc at Bell Laboratories from 1999 to 2000. 2001, he became a member of the technical staff. From 2004 to 2009, he was an assistant professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Florida. In 2009, he became an associate professor. He joined the Department of Physics of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology in 2010 as an associate professor, and in 2018 became a full professor. So uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Hoban Chan. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, also, uh, I want to thank uh, David Campbell for uh, organizing the workshop and um, giving me a chance to show you my, my work. So let me share my screen. Oops. Okay, so um, the title of my talk is the uh, strong uh, geometry dependence of Casimir force between two rectangular gratings. So we use microfabrication tools to make uh, rectangular gratings out of silicon and measure the Casimir force between them. This is an outline of my talk. Uh, you just heard from uh, Professor Decker that the Casimir force depends on the dielectric properties of the interacting bodies. Uh, another way to change the Casimir force is to make use of the shape of the objects. So in this talk, I will describe experiments from my group that studies this um, geometry dependence. So calculating the Casimir force between objects of arbitrary shapes is not a trivial task. Okay? A lot of sophistic sophisticated theories are developed uh, to do that. So for objects that deviates only slightly from uh, planar surfaces, it is possible to estimate the Casimir force using two approximations. They are the uh, proximity force approximation and the pairwise additive approximation. So previous experiments from the groups of uh, Uma Muhyiddin, uh, Ricardo Decker and mine uh, have used uh, nanoscale gratings uh, to show the deviations of the Casimir force from uh, these, two, these two approximations. So in this talk, I'll describe another regime. We have uh, nanoscale uh, rectangular 
gratings on both surfaces, and they are aligned with very high accuracy so that the gratings can interpenetrate. Uh, we measure the Casimir force in the uh, normal in the normal direction. So um, the um, there are a few interesting features for uh, this new geometry. So at certain distances, the PFA proximity force approximation completely breaks down. Uh, the factor of uh, 500 deviation from PFA is uh, by far the strongest uh, geometry dependence uh, reported so far. Uh, at other distance ranges, uh, the, uh, we find that the Casimir force can be independent of distance uh, while being non-zero and, and finite. So um, this experiment can only be uh, done using a, an on-chip uh, monolithic platform that, uh, that has been, uh, been used, uh, that my group has been using in the past decade. Uh, the sample fabric fabrication and measurements were done by my former students, uh, in particular, uh, Ming Kang uh, Wang. Uh, we collaborated with many uh, different theory groups throughout the, the years at different stages of uh, this project. And for the independent grading, gradings, we work with um, uh, Meryl and Tessa at uh, Montpellier, and also Alex Cross at, um, in China, and also the group of CT Chen at uh, HAUST. So uh, when um, Casimir predicted the attraction between uh, neutral conductors, he considered the uh, boundary conditions imposed uh, on two flat conducting surfaces um, on the quantum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. But in uh, almost all experiments, uh, at least one of the surfaces is chosen to be spherical. And that includes this experiment I, I did in uh, David Bishop's group more than 20 years ago at Bell Labs. Um, and I, I think this, this is the only experiment that um, measure the Casimir force between two flat surfaces. All the others involve some kind of uh, 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 spherical surface. And the reason uh, is that the Casimir force depends very strongly on distance and it is very difficult to keep two flat surfaces exactly parallel as small separations. So for a sphere, there's only one point of closest approach and one can avoid the alignment problem. So instead of a one over D fourth dependence, now it's a one over D cubed dependence for this geometry. So the distance dependence change with geometry, but this is a somewhat trivial uh, geometry dependence because if the separation D is much smaller than uh, the radius of curvature, the one over D cube uh, distance dependence can be derived using the proximity force approximation. So in this approximation, it's assumed that locally uh, the force uh, can be obtained by just the case of uh, parallel plates. And uh, when we say that the Casimir force is a strong function of geometry, or when we say the Casimir force is, has a non-trivial geometry dependence, we refer to situations where the force cannot be obtained by um, just using the uh, PFA or the uh, pairwise additive approximation. So the pairwise additive approximation is uh, another approach to uh, calculate the Casimir force between non-planar objects. It assumes that one can divide and extend the body into uh, the elementary constituents and add up the force uh, between each pair of constituents. Uh, it is also, on, also only an approximation because the intermolecular forces are not pairwise additive. The interaction between uh, two molecules is affected by the presence of a, a third molecule. And the um, pairwise additive approximation also breaks down for uh, complex geometries. Let me see. Yeah. So um, this is a uh, rather old experiment from my group to show the geometry dependence of the Casimir force. We replace one of the uh, flat surfaces uh, by a surface with by a surface with nanoscale uh, corrugations, and um, the measured Casimir force uh, deviates from the proximity force approximation and also the pairwise additive approximation. So um, remember that the PFA uh, assumes that locally the force uh, per unit area is just given by the case of two parallel uh, plates. So if we apply the PFA to this geometry, the relevant surfaces are the top of the uh, grading and also the bottom um, of, the, of the trench. And since the depth of the trench D is much smaller than the, um, the, the separation, um, only the top contributes to the force under this approximation. So the uh, force on the trench array under PFA will be exactly just half the force uh, on a solid, solid surface. 
So um, here we plot the ratio of the measured Casimir force to the expectation uh, of PFA. And the fact that the measured data deviates from one uh, demonstrate that uh, non-trivial geometry dependence uh, of the Casimir force. Uh, so to extend the calculation of Casimir forces from flat surfaces to gratings, it is necess it's necessary to replace the reflection uh, coefficients um, in Lisch's formula with uh, reflection matrices, right? Because uh, each incident wave can now scatter, it can be scattered along many um, different conditions, uh, different directions. And uh, uh, a number of groups have developed methods to calculate the Casimir force on periodic structures based on uh, scattering theory. So the calculations uh, show great agreement with um, our experiment, provided that uh, both the geometry effects and the material properties are taken into account. So our group is not the only group interested in uh, nanoscale gratings. Um, this team uh, by uh, uh, Ricardo Decker, uh, uh, Vladimir Aksuk, and Daniel Lopez, uh, they found deviations from uh, PFA on gratings that are made of gold. And you might have noticed that in both of the experiments that I described, uh, only one of the surface uh, has um, nanostructures and the other surface is a sphere. And again, this configuration is chosen due to alignment difficulties. Now imagine that um, corrugations are present on, on two planar surfaces. And in addition to keeping the two surfaces parallel, it's necessarily to uh, align the orientation of the grading and the lateral shift between them. So here I show you that there are actually a lot of interest in on the Casimir force when uh, both surfaces have nanoscale features, but these are all theory papers. Uh, this experiment by Mohidian's group is the only, uh, it's one of the very few papers where corrugations are present on both surfaces. They press a grating into uh, a gold sphere so, uh, so that the pattern is, is imprinted onto the sphere and they measure the force in situ. And they show that the lateral Casimir force can show significant, significant deviations from uh, PFA. So here I put PFA in quotation uh, because it is slightly different from what we discussed um, for the normal Casimir force. So to get the, the lateral Casimir force using PFA, the quantity that are summed for these parallel plates is actually the energy and not the force. So the calculation of energy is actually repeated for uh, many different lateral shifts. And uh, once the dependence of E on the lateral shift uh, Y uh, is available, then we can just um, take the spatial derivative with respect to the Y direction um, to get the lateral force. So in uh, Mohidin's uh, experiment, uh, the measured cas uh, lateral Casimir force is significantly different from the lateral um, force estimated uh, this way uh, from the PFA. So uh, as you can see, there are not that many experiments successful uh, in showing the deviations of the Casimir force from the proximity force approximation. And for the Casimir force in the normal direction, the deviations are about, about 30% for silicon gratings and um, about 80% uh, for the gold gratings in uh, Decker's group. So it is not easy to review the non-trivial geometry dependence of the Casimir force in experiments. And one has to work pretty hard to get a deviation from the PFA of few tenths of a percent. And from another point of view, uh, even though the PFA is very simple and requires minimal um, computational resources, it gives a reasonable estimation of the Casimir force in all experiments so far. And uh, using exact methods to calculate the Casimir force for a complicated geometry may take weeks or months uh, using a regular workstation. And the uh, PFA, um, despite its simplicity, uh, allows a very quick estimation of the Casimir force and the results will be correct to within an order of magnitude. So for the rest of the talk, I will show you an experiment in which the uh, PFA utterly breaks down. So the um, geometry dependence of the Casimir force is so strong in our samples uh, that even the order of magnitude uh, cannot be estimated using the PFA. So in the uh, experiment that I will talk about today, uh, we align two rectangular uh, gratings and uh, in a way that we can measure the Casimir force between them as the gratings in the penetrate. I think the, uh, right, like this, this is a, a, a video. And uh, this kind of near perfect alignment is only possible using a, a monolithic platform in which the uh, two most important elements in Casimir force measurement, the 
um, force sensor and the mechanism that controls the distance are both integrated on the same silicon chip. The approach is quite different from um, conventional experiments where there's a force sensing element and um, such as a cantilever or a torsional oscillator, just like uh, Ricardo dis, uh, described. And the second surface to confine the electromagnetic mode is an external bulky object. And once one must um, carefully place this object close to the force sensing element. Uh, in our approach, uh, both the, the, the two interacting objects are defined in a single step of lithography and are automatically aligned. So um, apart from fundamental um, interest in exploring complex geometries that cannot be done uh, by conventional methods, um, another reason we developed this platform uh, is because of the relevance of the Casimir force to uh, micro and nanomechanical uh, systems uh, have always been a driver behind um, experimental research. Uh, if the goal is for the Casimir force to play a uh, significant role, uh, play a role in um, uh, future micromechanical devices, uh, one must uh, eliminate the external object and show that the Casimir force uh, becomes the dominant interaction between components within the same uh, silicon chip. So let me briefly um, describe the detection platform. Um, first, just between two beams. Um, uh, with rectangular cross section, and later I will. Uh, we can uh, use the same platform uh, when we add gratings or uh, other uh, complex shapes um, to these two beams. So this movie here show you that we can um, change the distance between the two rods with uh, a rectangular cross section. The top one is stationary, and the bottom one um, is able to move. So the top one corresponds to this red beam um, that um, uh, does not have DC displacement. And the bottom one, we call it the movable electrode. The separation between them can be changed all the way from about two microns down to about 260 nanometer. So that there's a Casimir force between these two beams in the direction um, parallel to the substrate. So in uh, this SEM, the uh, beam is colored in red and the movable electrode uh, in blue. So the beam at the top is the force sensing element. Um, it uh, vibrates with a very small amplitude and we measured the force gradient from um, inferring from the uh, uh, resonance frequency shift on, on this beam. The movable electro at the bottom exerts different uh, uh, Casimir force on the beam depending on how far it is uh, from the beam. And the size of the beam is about 1.5 micron uh, and um, uh, 100 micron wide. What you see here is only a part of the device. Uh, this picture is out to show you the rest of the structure. Um, the, movable, uh, 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 the movable beam and the, uh, the move beam and the movable electrode is only here. And they are the only, re, uh, only component inside the entire structure where um, the surface are close enough so that Casimir force play a role. And the rest of the structure is used to control the distance. And this is what we call the COM actuator. It pushes the movable electrode towards the beam, right? As shown in, um, in, in this, sorry as shown in uh, this diagram here. All right, so uh, this is a simplified uh, uh, schematic of the COM actuator. There are two sets of interpenetrating figures, uh, fingers. Uh, the uh, one set that is gray is fixed to the substrate. It's not going to move. The other set shown in blue is movable as suspended by four springs. The other end of the spring is uh, anchored to the substrate. So when we apply a DC voltage, uh, between the uh, fixed com and the movable com, they attract each other through the electrostatic force, and the movable com will be um, moved towards the top. Oops, like this, move towards the top, and um, uh, and change the distance between the the, the two relevant surfaces. And um, this uh, the displacement is uh, depends on the uh, voltage applied to the to the to the com uh, square. And um, in the real device, there are four springs. You can see one of the springs here uh, with one end anchored to the uh, substrate and then the other end uh, supporting a movable comb. So um, the entire uh, mechanical setup is uh, only a few, uh, a few hundreds of micro micrometer uh, as compared to a few centimeter for piezoelectric stages using conventional uh, configuration. So the device is fabricated using standard SOI uh, process to suspend the 
mechanical structures. So this is a cross section of a silicon, silicon on insulator, a silicon on, um, on insulator wafer or SOI wafer. Uh, there's a middle um, yellow uh, layer that is uh, made of silicon oxide, about two microns thick. It will later act as a sacrificial layer. And the top layer is the, made of single crystal silicon that will form the movable mechanical structures. So we do uh, electron beam lithography to define the shape of the structures. Uh, the blue layer is an etching mass that's made of aluminum. And then we put the wafer into the plasma etcher and the plasma hits the wafer from above and remove the exposed uh, silicon that's not protected by the aluminum. And the important point is that we optimize the recipe so that the etching goes straight down and ends uh, at the uh, um, yeah, yellow oxide layer. Uh, the final panel shows how we release the structure. We put the sample in hydrofluoric acid uh, that dissolves only the um, yellow oxide and uh, leave the red silicon behind. And unlike the previous step that, um, that um, was very directional, here the, uh, uh, the um, liquid can go inside and undercut the, uh, the structure um, uh, and uh, free a, a small structure. So here you can see the main advantage of using microfabrication to create the structures. Because these two objects are uh, originally from the same silicon layer, their thickness and are identical and also the distance from the substrate uh, is identical. And assuming we do a good job at the third step in uh, the vertical direction of cut, we have two objects with rectangular cross sections that are automatically aligned uh, to each other. Uh, so this slide shows how we calculate the force. Um, the uh, force sensing element is a micromechanical beam. Uh, the beam is anchored at both ends, so we can think of it like a guitar, guitar string. And we infer the force gradient on the beam from the shift in, in, this, in its resonance frequency. So the concept is identical to all other Casimir force measurements. But instead of using optical detection for cantilevers and capacitive detection for torsional balances, here we use magnetomotive uh, detection. We place the wire in a DC uh, static, static magnetic field per, uh, perpendicular to the substrate. Then we apply an AC current uh, um, to generate a periodic Lorentz force. And we choose the frequency of the current so that the Lorentz force excites the fundamental mode in which the beam vibrates in plane. And as the, uh, as the beam vibrates in the magnetic field, it generates a back EMF. And this in turn reduces the uh, current by an amount that is proportional to the oscillation amplitude of the beam. So this plot shows the oscillation amplitude uh, measured uh, using the magnetomotive detection. Uh, when there is a electrostatic or Casimir force on the beam, this frequency will shift by an amount that is proportional to the force, to the force gradient. Uh, this slide shows the calibration of distance and uh, force sensitivity using the uh, 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 electrostatic force. So in conventional uh, Casimir force experiments involving a sphere and a plate, one applies a voltage between the two surfaces to uh, calibrate two constants. The first one is the proportionality constant, uh, between the actual force gradient and the quantity being measured, usually the frequency shift, the resonant frequency shift. And the second constant is the initial distance. So here we um, also need to do uh, a calibration based on electrostatic forces, uh, but uh, we need to make some changes to the uh, calibration procedure. I won't have time to go into um, all the details, but I can uh, certainly be um, uh, happy to answer your questions. And just like um, all the other Casimir force measurements, uh, we need to balance the residual voltage. So each parabola here is taken at a fixed distance. Um, it shows that the measured force gradient depends quadratically right, on the uh, voltage between the beam and the movable electrode. And as the distance decreases, the parabolas become narrower because the electrostatic force has, um, uh, has increased. And the vertical shift uh, correspond to forces that cannot be balanced by a voltage, including Casimir forces and forces due to patch potentials. So uh, we use this platform to study um, the patch force between two arrays of T-shaped protrusions uh, shown in this picture. And we, um, we find that the uh, force gradient can be uh, positive or negative. The force depends non-monotonically um, on the distance. So uh, for, the, for the rest of the talk, uh, actually, I will discuss another geometry. As I mentioned earlier, we fabricated rectangular gratings uh, aligned so that they can interpenetrate. So the top view is the, uh, the, top view of the uh, is, uh, shows the geometry. Um, 
They are perfectly rectangular gratings made of silicon. So before doing any complicated um, uh, calculations, let's look at what the uh, uh, PFA uh, will give us. So uh, initially, the PFA is essentially zero uh, because uh, when we divide the structures into parallel plates, the relative surfaces are very far apart. Um, this situation um, changes when the two gratings start to interpenetrate. So when we apply the uh, PFA in the same way for calculating the lateral Casimir force, so instead of summing the, um, the force uh, between the overlap regions, uh, we sum the energy. Right? So this energy is zero right, before the uh, two gratings interpenetrate, and then it increases linearly right, as the lower grating is pushed in the y direction. Um, and uh, when we take the spatial derivative of the um, Casimir force, uh, the um, energy uh, uh, derivative becomes a, a step in, in the force. So the force starts off at zero, and then there's a, a sudden sharp jump to a uh, constant value corresponding to the slope of the energy. And this is independent of displacement. If the displacement keep increasing, uh, eventually the force will start to rise, right? Because the top of the grating becomes close to the uh, other body, the, the, the body of the other, other structure. So here we can apply uh, PFA in the normal way by uh, 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 dividing the surfaces into small plates. So um, in the bottom figure, we plot the force gradient, right? That is um, usually the quantity measured in uh, experiments. So the uh, PFA result, uh, sorry, I meant to focus on the PFA result that was blue. Um, so the, the um, PFA for, for the force gradient is just a derivative of, 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 of here. And there's a delta function right, uh, at um, uh, where the interpenetration occurs. And for this region where the force is constant, the force gradient is actually zero. And um, of course, right, in uh, we do not expect the actual uh, Casimir force gradient will be infinitely large. Uh, after all, PFA is just a approximation. So the red line here is a calculation using SCUF. But SCUF is a boundary uh, element method and the codes are developed by Homer Um, It is expected to give the actual Casimir force for arbitrary shaped objects, as long as the meshes are fine enough and there's sufficient computation power. So not surprisingly, the sharp rise uh, in the Casimir force is moved out and the delta function in the force gradient becomes a peak, a finite peak. Uh, interestingly, the um, scuff calculations uh, agree with the PFA after interpenetration. And this behavior is not uh, obvious to me before doing these uh, calculations. And for distances um, at which interpenetration occurs, uh, PFA completely breaks down. Right, PA, uh, PFA, um, sorry, scuff, um, uh, sorry, PFA predicts a infinitely high force gradient and the uh, uh, actual Casimir force gradient is, is finite, right? So um, I point out that the amount of computation uh, to generate these two red curves, uh, uh, the red curve and the blue curve are very different, right? The price to pay for exact calculation using the uh, scuff is very high. The scuff calculations um, is done using a server with uh, 18 processors and 48 cores, and it takes several weeks. And the PFA is essentially immediate, right? provided that you know the Casimir energy between two flat plates, uh, it is almost in instantaneous to generate the, the PFA curve. So the um, grading geometry is familiar to many research teams who work on scattering theory. Uh, scattering theory is based on analyzing the Fourier components. Uh, my understanding is that the scattering theory only works when the two objects are well are separated by a well-defined uh, boundary, and it cannot calculate the Casimir force once the gradients interpenetrate. Uh, however, uh, the scattering uh, theory should have no problem um, in this region, right before to the left of the step before the, the gradients interpenetrate. So for a new geometry, it's always um, good to have two different ways of calculating of calculation to cross-check with each other. Here we collaborated with um, and, uh, Murrow and Tesla's group and Montpellier uh, for scattering theory calculations. And the calculations are shown in black. And you can see that they are in very good uh, agreement with the boundary element um, method calculations. So it gives us confidence that um, uh, 
the scuff calculations are actually correct uh, for the rest of the for the rest of the displacement. So while well, we use the um, well, we fabricate the, uh, the uh, rectangular gratings using our on-chip platform and measure the Casimir force gradient. Here I show you the calibration using the electrostatic force and also the set of parabolas when we apply a voltage between the two interacting uh, uh, the gratings. And the contour plot is a 3D plot um, of these parabolas. And we identify the vertical shift of the parabolas as the Casimir force. So the uh, measured force gradient is shown in black. Uh, and the calculation using scuff uh, is shown in red. So the overall dependence is actually very similar to the, re the perfect rectangular gratings uh, that we have discussed before. The SEMs on the left-hand side uh, show you the different regimes as the two gratings are pushed together. Uh, region one is before interpenetration. Re region two is when interpenetration occurs uh, marked by this dashed line. Uh, region three, is when the force is um, constant so that the force gradient is almost zero. Region four is when the top of the gradient becomes, uh, approaches the main body of the, um, the, of the beam. So one thing that is quite different from the perfect rectangular gradient is that the force uh, gradient is not exactly zero in region three, uh, but it kind of fluctuates. Uh, we find that this is due to the roughness uh, on the gradings. Right? So to do the scuff calculations, um, we use the actual shape uh, of our gratings. Uh, so we obtain the shape by digitizing the um, top view scanning electron micrograph. And the grading looks very good uh, at this magnification. But when we zoom way in, we find that there are actually uh, fluctuations. And these are roughness. These roughness also give uh, fluctuations in, uh, of the red curve. And overall, the uh, agreement between measurement and uh, calculation is quite good for the force gradient. Uh, in the bottom panel, uh, we integrate the force gradient to get the force as a function of uh, distance. So this is the first time that a non-zero Casimir force that is um, uh, independent of distance um, is uh, experimentally measured. Uh, the, uh, the agreement is good for most parts except uh, uh, the very end here. So the red band here represents the force obtained by uh, shrinking or expanding the digitized geometry by one pixel of the SEM. So the deviations that we observe with, um, uh, 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 is uh, consistent with uh, one, one pixel variation in um, the uh, uh, shape of the sample. Right. Um, here we uh, show the measured force, the same, same data I showed you in the last slide uh, in black. And uh, we also show the PFA that is uh, in blue. So unlike the, we no longer have a sharp jump right, in the PFA because we are actually using the actual geometry of our sample. Uh, on the right-hand side, I plot the ratio between these two curves, right? the ratio of the measured force to PFA. So this ratio reaches about 473 right, in, in, our, in our experiment. So for uh, experiments between gratings and a plane, um, this ratio lies between about 0.2 to about 1.3. So if we take this ratio as how strong the geometry dependence of the Casimir force uh, is, then we have the strongest experimentally observed geometry dependence so far. Uh, we can also compare our measurement uh, to the pairwise additive approximation. Uh, we work with Alex Cross to use the uh, Van der Waal potential that is written in terms of the polarizabilities of the, two of the interacting atoms. Uh, and the polarizability is related to the uh, dielectric function through the clausius masotti relation. Uh, then we integrate basically over volumes of the two objects, assuming that the interaction is pairwise additive. So the result for a perfect rectangular grading is shown in uh, purple here for pairwise uh, addition, uh, together with the scuff calculation, the exact force, and also the PFA. And um, so you see that it turns out that the pairwise addition, uh, pairwise additive approximation works pretty well before the two gradings start to interpenetrate, and deviations uh, start uh, uh, will show up when uh, in the interpenetration region. So the PFA and the PAA works uh, well at, at different regimes. The PAA works well at large separation when, when the two sources are, are far apart. And the PFA works well um, and agrees with scuff after the two objects in the penetrate. And we can also do the, the um, uh, uh, 
PAA using exact uh, uh, using the exact shape of our of our structure, uh, and uh, our result is very similar to a perfect rectangular grading. It agrees well at this region, and then it deviates uh, when interpenetration uh, occurs. Okay, so um, one important question to ask is uh, how will the Casimir force change uh, when the grading parameters are changed? Right? For rectangular gratings, the most important parameter uh, is the gap lateral gap between two adjacent uh, fingers. It, depend, it determines the um, uh, value of the constant um, Casimir force and, uh, um, and the peak uh, in the Casimir force gradient. So even though it is not uh, possible for us to um, change this parameter because it involves actually making many, many samples, uh, we can actually do uh, scuff calculations right, to get the um, exponent. And we find that the constant force that does it independent of distance scales with distance to the uh, third power. Okay, so I think I am running uh, out of time. So uh, let me uh, acknowledge the people who have done the work. Um, uh, Yiling Bao and uh, uh, Jay Zhou, they were my students at Florida who um, created the uh, uh, deep trenches for, uh, for measuring between uh, uh, gold sphere and the trenches. And the uh, monolithic platform was first developed by uh, Jay and, and So. Um, and we continue that in Nature UST. Uh, Tang Lu used it for uh, use to measure the Casimir force between um, uh, T-shaped protrusions and show the Casimir force can be non-monotonic. And the result that you talk about, that you heard about today is mostly done by uh, Ming Kang. Uh, he spent a lot of work um, in refining the um, the uh, lithography. So this is our first attempt in, in measuring the, uh, the interpenetrating grading. We couldn't resolve anything. You can see the smoothing of the, the fingers. And um, after developing a new process using even lithography, um, he is able to, to show, to, to um, uh, see the, um, the peak in the force gradient. And um, also uh, I can help, uh, there's a story about the lateral stability. Um, it turns out that uh, lateral stability is very important in, in, in getting clean data. Okay, so this is a, just a summary. So um, we have an on-trip platform to measure the Casimir force. And uh, we measure the Casimir force between two interpenetrating gratings. Um, we have complete breakdown of the PFA, a factor of 5,000 5, deviation for PFA. And we find a Casimir force that is independent of uh, displacement. So uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Terrific talk. I have a question uh, from the audience. Um, um, so the question is uh, from uh, my colleague, uh, Sham uh, Aramili, and it says, uh, beautiful experiments and a wonderful talk. How do you ensure that the Coulomb forces are accounted for in the interdigitated combs? Can you get that? How are the Coulomb force accounted for? And How do you uh, ensure that the uh -huh. Coulomb forces are accounted for uh -huh. in the interdigitated columns? Okay, um, so let me go back to my share screen. Okay, um, so um, the uh, Coulomb forces, um, uh, so the electrostatic forces between the two surfaces are minimized, right? By the electrostatic force, uh, is, is depends on the distance square, and um, by uh, adjusting the compensating voltage to the minimum of, of, of this point, we um, get rid of uh, all the uh, charges that that are movable, the mobile ch the charges, we can, we can uh, 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 get rid of, of th those. Uh, for uh, trap charges, um, basically we were uh, in other experiments, not in my experiment, they were using gold surfaces. So it is relatively inert. And, um, and uh, if the surfaces are clean, um, then those, um, uh, trap charges, the, the effect uh, would be uh, relatively small. Uh, there are effects of patch potentials that uh, also Ricardo, Ricardo Decker also mentioned that is correspond to the um, 
polycrystalline nature of the gold surface. So those are uh, uh, because the, 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 work, the work function, basically the, the um, work function between the two surfaces might not be uh, identical. And for each grain, it could be different. So those are the patch potentials that um, um, uh, has to be uh, taken into account. Uh, in our structure, it is single, it is silicon. So uh, if there is oxide on the silicon, then indeed, but we, there, there could be a lot of trap charges. So I skip a lot of experimental details. So um, immediately um, before, well, actually we, um, uh, after the release step to get rid of the oxide, uh, let me see if I can find it. Right. So in the in the last step uh, in the release is to to remove the underlying oxide using uh, HF. So um, and this release step also passif pacifate the uh, silicon surface. So the uh, oxide the, the 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 silicon surface can remain relatively uh, can remain pristine for a short amount of time, a few hours. And we within this a few hours we load the sample into um, our probe, pump it out and lower it into our cryostat. So um, uh, we do our best in uh, avoiding formation of oxide, but uh, we cannot completely rule it out. So, so, um, um, so that is how we, we, we uh, minimize the effect of uh, trap charges in, in the independent, uh, in, in not only in the, in the penetrating fingers, actually in, in all the, uh, structures that 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 we have made that we have measured using this monolithic um, scheme. Thank you. Um, more questions. So let me ask a technical question. Have you tried to do use any techniques to smooth the surface? Um, um, so, for example, there's some evidence if you use ALD, you can uh, create sort of smoother surfaces and things like that. So, if you tried uh, uh, if you tried to, to modify or sort of smooth the surface, I thought about that. Coding? Never, never um, got around. Okay, um, my actually first one. One of the reason I I, uh, I actually have a slide on this. Uh, when I first developed this, when my students first developed this technique, I my thought was that, uh, well, I mean, let me let me make a comments about this technique first. Um, um, it is not going to replace the uh, conventional method uh, of sphere uh, plate, right? Because, uh, not because of the force sensitivity. We actually have plenty of force sensitivity and we can actually do other things to increase the force sensitivity. The major reason is the unknown in the shape of the sample. So in uh, the sphere plate, um, the, uh, the, the, the objects can be characterized very well using AFM, the roughness and the, and the shapes are very well defined. And in this case, uh, I, what I show you is that I, we only did the top surface. We, we digitized the top surface. And the uh, side walls, right, is, I, I don't have a good way to, uh, so you can see some side walls here. Right here, you can see the sidewall. Actually, they, they do have some roughness, and it's difficult to 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 um, to 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 characterize. So, uh, Dave, your question is: Can we modify this surface? So, actually, uh, I thought about that, and my first uh, actually that go back data they, they back to what we did in Bell Labs uh, that TMAH can polish um, uh, can can reveal can 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 polish. Uh, a, a silicon surface to to almost uh, atomic thickness along certain crystal crystalline directions directions. So uh, when I first started this this experiment, I was trying to look for SOI wafers. Uh, so so but the, the, the only thing is that to to get this kind of configuration, you need the crystal orientation instead of one zero zero to be one one zero. And I was trying to get SOI wafers with one one zero, and they only sell it. They only sell it in a batch of, I don't know, uh, uh, 50 or something. And that was my entire budget at that time. So, so uh, I, I wasn't able to do this part. Uh, for ALD, I'm not sure. So ALD, I think you can code uh, a surface with monolayer. I think that is what you, um, 
Like your question right, was so, about. So, so there's some anecdotal evidence that the ALD layers uh, will help sort of fill in the roughnesses. So essentially surface tension takes over. Anyway, it might be worthwhile having a conversation offline. So you could you could you could, you could use it as a as a as a way to essentially fill in the gaps. Um, I see. Okay. So you know, so put, you can put in nanometer, ten nanometer type 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 coatings with quite a bit of control. And so you mm -hmm. can basically use that to, to, to smooth the surface. Anyway, it's a technical question we should probably discuss offline. Anyway, any more questions for Hoban? Okay, terrific talk, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, next it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor uh, Lila Woods. She Lilia. has gained her PhD Lilia. in this. I'm sorry? Lilia. Lilia, I'm sorry. Lilia. Lilia, I apologize. That's right, Lilia. no problem. Um, uh, she obtained her PhD in condensed matter physics under the guidance of uh, Professor Gerald Mahan. After graduation, she became a postdoc at Oak Ridge National Labs, followed by a second postdoc at the Naval Research Lab, where she held the prestigious directors funded NRC fellowship. In 2003, she became an assistant professor at the University of South Florida. And in 2012, she was promoted to full professor. Uh, Professor Wood's diverse research in theoretical and computational condensed matter physics has been continuously funded by the National Science Foundation and Department of Energy since 2006. She has been recognized by the USF Outstanding Research Achievement Award three times and by the Jewell Faculty Excellence Award. She's a member of the National Academy of Inventors and she received the International Association of Advanced, Metals, Advanced Materials Medal for 2018. Uh, Professor Woods was also elected an APS Fellow in 2017 and an AAS, uh, AAAS Fellow in 2019. Uh, Professor Woods, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see the screen? Yes. All right. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. I actually did not uh, expect such a thorough introduction. <laughs> uh, um, and I also am quite appreciative to the organizers for putting this together and giving me an opportunity to uh, present to you some of our recent work on fluctuation induced interactions in quantum materials. And this research has been supported by the Department of um, Energy. So let me begin with uh, some fundamental knowledge because I see that there are people in the audience that are not uh, in the, let's say in the Casimir community. Um, our current understanding of um, where the uh, Casimir force comes from is related to uh, our understanding that the exchange of transient quantized electromagnetic fluctuations between objects give rise to fluctuation induced interactions. And one such force is the one is the Casimir van der Waals interaction. So perhaps up until recently, uh, this force was thought to be relatively uh, small and more like a curiosity, at least in the condensed matter community. Um, but actually that is not the case because um, for example, the stiction of elements in micro machines or even the motion of um, some uh, animals happens because of this particular force. And um, the explosion uh, in material science due to the discovery of many uh, layered materials has elevated the importance of the Van der Waals force because after all their stability happens because specifically of the Van der Waals interaction. And recently now the dynamical Casimir effect has become quite interesting because of the possibility to produce real photons, giving rise to something that is called a quantum vacuum thruster, uh, which of course is envisioned to uh, move objects in, the, uh, in space and uh, essentially harness energy from vacuum. And even more recently, people are talking about quantum diffusion and decoherence, which is quite uh, uh, important for uh, quantum information science, for example. And there are even proposals for devices at the nanoscale that operate precisely, they move, they mo uh, uh, they operate based on the Van der Waals interaction as well. So, um, the uh, here I want to stress that um, the Casimir force is actually a universal interaction. It happens between 
any two objects, regardless of their properties, regardless of um, uh, what they're made of, as long as they have some finite boundaries like the uh, geometry that I have shown here, there will be a fluctuation induced interaction such as the casting of Annabelle's force. So for historical reasons, it has two names, depending if retardation is included or not included into um, uh, the picture. And that's what we speak of, Van Waals and Casimir Force, but actually it's the same thing. So um, the question that we are asking here is what does this force depend on? And we can get a glimpse into that by looking at the Lipschitz formalism through which we can write an expression for the exchange energy between two objects due to these fluctuation exchange, exchanges. And when I look at this expression, I see that there are two important factors that we need to consider. One is the electromagnetic boundary conditions, which are captured in the, into the Fresnel reflection matrices. And uh, Hoban already spoke at length about how to probe the, uh, uh, the role of the boundary conditions into the Cassini interaction. But in addition to that, the properties of the materials matter also. And they're captured into the dielectric and magnetic responses, which also appear into the Fresnel reflection matrices, depending on the geometry. So the complex interplay between these two factors make the force, uh, this universal force, have non-universal dependencies on many factors, such as fundamental constants, dimensionality, the separation of the object, even the sign and the magnitude are non-universal. So for comparison, if we think about the Coulomb force, for example, which we know how it depends on charges and distances between any two objects, micro objects, we cannot say that for the Cassini interaction because of this complex interplay. So there is nothing universal about this universal force. So since this is a materials workshop, what I'd like to talk to you today is how to probe not the boundary conditions, but the properties of the materials in a planar geometry and see how Casimir forces can be used as a further tool to understand basic physics in materials. So I, I want to begin with the case of carbon materials. What else? And my first uh, representative is uh, graphene. Um, to, as I said, to know the dielectric properties of the materials, we have to understand their electronic structure first. And that is determined by the atomic structure. So for graphene, we know that the low energy dispersion is linear with respect to the wave vector as it follows from the Dirac Hamiltonian, which I have given here in, in part C of the picture to the right. And for comparison, I'm giving types of Hamiltonians that appear, characteristic types of Hamiltonians that appear in other uh, condensed matter systems, um, and they'll um, uh, have their own consequences like, uh, in, in, in the electronic structure and later in the optical response. Now, if we cut the graphene along a certain direction, we, uh, uh, a new object is created. These are graphene nanoribbons. And immediately the effect of edging now is felt into the electronic structure, into the band structure, as I have written here for the case of armchair non-ribbons. So this linear band picture that I'm showing above, which is actually the Dirac cone, now translates into a bunch of bands creating a valence and conduction region with a gap that occurs at the gamma point, unlike the K point where this um, uh, point, Dirac point appears. In addition to this planar quasi 1D object, we can also create a circular, rather cylindrical uh, carbon material, which are the carbon nanotubes. And again, depending on how we wrap the, the, uh, the sheet into a cylindrical geometry, we obtain chiral dependent properties and here I'm giving an example of one particular tube, such as armchair carbon nanotube. So all of these uh, properties will 
translate into some unique characteristics into their dialectic response. And for this, we have used the Kubo formalism standard approach to calculate uh, the electric response. And I'm giving you some examples of the optical conductivity of graphene, graphene nanoribbons, and nanotubes. The, one of the important things that we notice is that in graphene, the low frequency regime up until even 3V maybe, the conductivity is constant. A direct consequence of the fact that we have a Dirac Hamiltonian in two dimensions, not three, two dimensions. On the other hand, the many bands created because of the edging in the graphene non-ribbons creates um, um, uh, transitions between the valence and the conduction range, which are expressed in terms of these peaks. And they depend on the number of carbon atoms, on the width of the ribbon, on the edges, and, and, uh, and other things. Something similar happens for carbon nanotubes, where I'm giving results for um, uh, two types of carbon nanotubes, 11-0 and 10-0, following standard nomenclature to label carbon nanotubes. Okay, so what happens to the force? So using a Lifshitz-like formalism, we can now take a glimpse at how the Casimir force behaves between two identical graphenes, two identical carbon nanoribbons, two identical carbon nanotubes. And here is um, some results of the quantum mechanical interaction when retardation is neglected between two graphene nanoribbons. And what we see is that there is a wide variation on a distance on the scaling law, depending on the chemical potential. And what is surprising is that the electronic structure actually captured into, uh, due to the um, particular edging, especially in the Coulomb interact, uh, uh, coupling, affects significantly the distance law, which for some cases we can't even find an analytical expression. Um, so it, it affects significantly the interaction if uh, uh, the uh, particular edging is taken into account or not. For the case of nanotubes, it's also, the situation is also in, uh, interesting. Here, we're giving results for the interaction between two individual carbon nanotubes organized in a double wall nanotube complex. And the interesting thing we see is that the interaction is actually um, grouped into two groups, um, depending on chirality that is enumerated by this standard uh, um, uh, uh, labeling M0 and N. N, as you can see by the blue and the red uh, um, and the green curve. So uh, how does that, so what, what can we learn from here? So here are some uh, uh, main uh, consequences that we have learned and several people have actually contributed to the understanding, especially of the interaction between two graphene uh, sheets, uh, such as Galena and Umar and other people in the panel. So perhaps the most striking um, consequence of the Dirac nature and the two-dimensional uh, nature of the graphene is that the effect of thermal fluctuations become, becomes extremely important at relatively small distance separations. For example, at distances that, let's say, 50 nanometers and above, the Casimir force between two graphene sheets is due entirely to thermal fluctuations, and the electronic structure doesn't really matter that much. The quantum, rather, the quantum mechanical effects don't really matter uh, that much. In graphene non-ribbons, um, actually, all it matters is the thermal fluctuations in all uh, regions that we looked at. In carbon nanotubes, the, we found something quite surprising that the force between two concentric tubes is strongest when there is an overlap of peaks in the electron, um, uh, the uh, uh, ELS spectrum. And for those two tubes for which there is an overlap between the peaks, the interaction is the strongest. And actually, this somehow is in line with experimental evidence that. Um, there are a lot more armchair armchair nanotubes 
uh, or, uh, you know, synthesized as opposed to other chiral combinations. Actually, 75% of tubes that are being synthesized in the laboratory are of that type of orientation, which is exactly falls along what I just said. So perhaps um, the Casimir force makes some kind of contribution to the stability of double or carbon nanotubes as well. But this is not, this is just the beginning of the material story of the Casimir force. Um, recently, we have uh, learned that not only carbon, but all atoms in the carbon um, uh, group in the periodic table uh, have these kind of 2D uh, hexagonal materials. So unlike graphene, which is flat, silicine, germanine, stannine, and even plumbing for, for lead, the last one, they can organize in a 2D uh, manner like I've shown here. But this time, the layer is not flat, but is um, staggered because the two atoms in the unit cell of the material, they don't, uh, they, they, they're big, they're bigger. So they want to or, uh, uh, be oriented uh, slightly, uh, one is slightly higher than the other. So when we did the electronic structure of the materials, we see that for the planar graphene and for the silicine, the band structure is quite similar actually, but there are some differences at the, uh, around the special K points where precisely the Dirac nature of the material is being uh, apparent. So to see this better, we took the electronic structure and we mapped it into a tight binding Hamiltonian and here are some parameters. And I am drawing your attention to two parameters. One is the spin orbit coupling, which in graphene is practically zero. But as we go further down in the periodic, uh, in the group, in the periodic table, the carbon group, we see that the spin orbit coupling increases and is done is quite sizable, 0.1 eV, 100 MeV. The other thing is the staggering, the um, uh, misalignment of the, the planar misalignment of the two atoms, which increases as the number of electrons, I mean, as the um, number in the periodic table increases. So it turns out that this type of physics, plus some more, can be arranged into a low uh, energy Dirac like Hamiltonian, similar as the one that I showed earlier for pure graphene, but this time. Um, in addition to the Dirac nature that is here, we can create a, a band gap at that special K point, which can be modulated by the spin orbit coupling. But there's also this, uh, and there's also a possibility to do that with an applied electric field perpendicular to the layer and also circularly polarized light that's being shown. So as these um, properties, are changed, modulated, we have a whole phase diagram, topologically non-trivial phase diagram for this uh, type of materials. And it turns out that many of the phases that I'm showing here that are due precisely to uh, so-called churn number, which comes from the uh, whole conductivity, whole conductivity response of the material is unique for the 2D materials. And they're not present in 3D topologically non-trivial system. So perhaps the most interesting thing that we found here is that in the anomalous Hall effect uh, region, which is here, um, repulsion and quantization of the calcium force becomes possible because we can write a rather succinct expression showing that the interaction is due, can be mapped into, can be uh, described with the, um, with the product of the two churn numbers. Since the churn numbers could, the product could be positive or negative and they're essentially quantized numbers. Their um, uh, interaction becomes uh, quantized, but it could also turn into a repulsion or attraction. Okay, but again, this is somehow in the middle of my story. The materials library keeps expanding and now we have three-dimensional materials that are similar to graphene. What I showed just a minute ago, these are 2D systems that are similar to graphene, but in the 3D scale, um, systems like vial semimetals are considered to be the graphene cousin. So what is a graphene semimetal? 
Um, the, in, the, the thing here is that the graphene, the, the valsinine metal is a three-dimensional Dirac material in which time reversal or inversion symmetry is broken. And as a result, the degenerate cone in 3D, now it's called vial cone, is split into two. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, this degeneracy is lifted. And in addition to that, now 3D uh, uh, graphene <laughs> cousins allow uh, two types of valsinine metals, type one and type two, depending on the tilting of the cone. And some practical realization of the two type two um, uh, direct, uh, graphene, um, valsinine metals are molybdenum telluride two, molybdenum tungsten two. To make things more interesting, um, valsinine metals now allow us that not only bulk properties are important, but also if we have a semi-infinite valsinine metals, there are something, the surface states such as uh, that are called Fermi arc states, and they contribute separately to the electronic and optical response. In addition to that, highly tilted valsinine metals, there are no, uh, uh, there are projections on the surface from the electron and hole uh, 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 carriers, and now this is similar to the electronic searches I'll show you for graphene. So uh, the optical response is quite complicated, and I have shown just some expressions that we're able to obtain. The first thing is that the response is very, very anisotropic. The second thing that we, we show is that the energy cutoff, which is essentially a parameter that tells us where the linear band approximation is valid, now enters explicitly into the expression. Actually, my results depend strongly on that energy cutoff. The other thing is that there is a whole conductivity contribution that has a topological character due to the B, which is the separation between the cones, but also non-topological contribution that simply comes from the tilting of the cones. And even more importantly, the Fermi arcs contribute a um, conductivity response, optical conductivity response, also highly anisotropic and has nothing to do with the electronic structure. It's strictly from the separation of the cones at I have shown. And putting this into the Lipschitz like formalism, which actually needed further development because of this highly anisotropic nature, we see that the energy uh, can be modulated, depends differently on, on distance. The cutoff energy is quite important. The tilt, the chemical potential, all of these enter non-trivially into my expression. So to get a sense of what is happening, what we're able to find is that in vial semi-metal, the, there is a characteristic distance dependence in which uh, various regimes become important. And this characteristic distance is set by the chemical, uh, uh, by the cutoff uh, parameter. Unlike the case for graphene, where the characteristic distance is set essentially by the Fermi velocity of, of, of the material. So what we see is that the interaction between valsinium metal is not uh, really, it doesn't really show any topologically non-trivial nature because everything is overwhelmed by the bulk uh, response and it's essentially the uh, the the interaction between um, metallic like uh, systems. The other um, uh, important thing to realize is that the presence, the explicit presence of the cutoff energy, is an indication that the um, atomic structure is actually important, and one has to in order to get a better picture of what the Van der Waals or the Casimir force would be, we really have to look at the entire band structure of the material and not only at what is happening at the, uh, uh, around the, uh, in the low energy regime. So with this in mind, I said, okay, let's take a look at some real representatives of um, uh, uh, valsinium metals and go beyond what is happening um, yeah, beyond the uh, linear response model or the effective model that I showed you earlier for the 3D uh, Dirac system. And these are results that we have done using ab initio simulations with density functional theory. 
And I'm showing you the electronic band structure for bulk molybdenum telluride 2 and tungsten telluride 2. And these red circles show, um, uh, indicate where the vial cones are going to be. And as you can see, the band structure is quite complicated and it has essentially a metallic-like uh, character. And the, um, the, the effect of the cones is sort of mixed in with everything else. So to see this into the uh, optical response, we simulated the optical response using a, um, again, the Kubo formalism, but this time adopted for numerical uh, calculations. And these are simulations of the real conductivity for the two materials along the X, Y, and Z component, uh, showing highly anisotropic um, uh, optical response, but also taking into account the full band structure of the material. So um, all of these peaks and valleys, uh, they're due to uh, transitions that are allowed in the crystal itself. And we actually calculated from first principles the um, plasma frequency along the X, Y, Z direction for the, the two materials. Actually, this, these results are quite consistent with um, experiments that have been done. Um, on probing the optical response of these materials. So um, one particular question that I was quite interested in is to uh, see where is the surface uh, response, right? So we want to be able to separate the uh, uh, optical response from the bulk from the optical response from the surface, because according to our uh, calculations based on the effective uh, medium uh, model, what we see is that very, very faint um, contribution from the non-trivial topology, unlike the case in 2D materials, 2D Dirac materials, and everything is overwhelmed by the bulk response. Um, and in here, I'm showing you the difference between the conductivity that is due to the surface of a semi-infinite material minus the optical conductivity that is due to the bulk. So all the positive, uh, all the, the peaks that appear above the zero line are due to the surface. And we see that the, uh, uh, the role of the surface is felt in the very, very low uh, optical regime, as you can see here. And actually some of these peaks they are seen experimentally, but no topology. All of these, all of this structure is essentially due not because of some kind of fancy non-trivial topology, but it's due because of the chemistry of the material. It's due because of the coupling, the different coupling of the atoms on the surface and what follows next. So what I'm trying to say is that the response, the optical response of these systems, the only uh, at least interesting things in the context of Casimir physics is that sort of linear dependence with respect to omega and it's anisotrop and anisotropy. The role of topology is buried um, in it. So the other thing that we saw computationally is that the um, uh, scattering time or the relaxation times matters a lot. As we keep increasing it, um, the peaks get smoothed and the response sort of diminishes um, as, as shown, shown here. So with this, I'd like to end my, my, my presentation and try to be on time. Um, I don't have lots of um, you know, detailed uh, conclusions, but what I'd like to say is that um, people who work in Casimir physics actually, in my opinion, work in rather broad field because in order to be able to describe or fundamentally provide a picture of the Casimir interaction, we have to know a lot of condensed matter physics. We have to know the electronic structure, but we also have to know the optical response of the systems. So inadvertently, by doing this, not only do we help our own community, but if we know the dielectric, uh, the dielectric response or the optical response, we uh, contribute to other broader fields. Um, so one thing that I thought I would mention is that uh, now everybody's talking about materials 
uh, design for all sorts of purposes. So we, why not talk about materials design for particular Casimir effects, right? Something that we want to see uh, that the Casimir force do, well, we need to design the material. And this sort of approach, I think, has not been explored yet. Uh, the other thing that I, I noticed is that in 3D systems that are anisotropic and they have non-trivial topology, they have giant, most of them have giant nonlinear optical response. Well, uh, there is no understanding currently how Van der Waals interactions uh, behave when uh, nonlinear effects are taken into account. Essentially, the Lifshitz approach and all other theoretical methods that we use are based on linear response models. But um, now these new materials force us to go beyond that picture. And then if we're talking about, let's say, interactions at smaller scales, like 10 nanometer, 20, whatever, maybe now phonons become important. And Casimir forces, uh, in, in some cases, they may feel the effects of phonons. In other words, phonon-mediated Casimir interactions may become uh, important. So with this, I'd like to end and acknowledge some uh, collaborators that I've you know, I've been working on with recently, Matthias Kruger, Victor, uh, Nail, Galina, Vladimir, Pablo, and Alexander Balatsky, um, who was especially useful for our uh, computational um, efforts. And I hope with my, with ending my talk with this um, uh, future outlook, um, will convince you that this is not really a um, curiosity type of research, but actually it has very, very broad implications, especially in the context of uh, the recent interest in quantum mechanics and quantum materials. So with this, I'm going to end, and I think I'm on time. Thank you. A lovely talk, thank you. Uh, questions? So could you maybe elaborate a little bit about your comment about uh, uh, the phonon interactions and the kinds of things that uh, might happen, what kinds of, you know, so you may be... Uh, uh, uh... So this is something that I just started looking at. Uh, for example, um, if we have, um, let's say, layered materials that the uh, distance between them is quite small on the order of nanometer um, scale, for example, or even a little bit larger, uh, then at uh, temperatures that are non-zero, there are vibrations of the atoms, right? Of the ions, rather. Well, these vibrations, so things are not static. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, if things vibrate, then the surfaces are going to vibrate. And I do know that phonons um, and uh, at temperatures that are non-zero, they, uh, in the context of Casimir effects, actually they make uh, very, very strong contributions, let's say in the near field exchange or heat transfer, let's say. But I don't think this problem has been looked at in the case of Casimir interactions or Van der Waals interactions, if you will. So as two layers sort of um, vibrate or oscillate because of these uh, phonon modes, then the Casimir force is going to change uh, for sure. And um, this goes more towards the, the, let's say, the boundary conditions that are going to be to change. And how that's going to happen, I, I don't know at the moment. Okay, thank you. David, did you have a comment or question? No, Dave, I, I did not. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I thought you had your hand, uh, your hand raised. I, I, I was trying to do something else, sorry. <laughs> Okay, uh, no, it looks like Jeremy Mundy has a question. Jeremy. Hi, yes, uh, th thanks for an excellent talk. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I was wondering, with these anisotropic um, uh, materials, have you looked into um, like rotational and torque uh, effects? Yeah, we're trying to do that now. Uh, actually, so we're looking at, um, uh, I mean, sort of the, I'm trying to find materials for which uh, the torque could be quite uh, interesting. Uh, because of the anisotropy of the material. So in the case of Valsley metals, sort of, to me, things are sort of predictable, right? Okay. But uh, let's say the recent system that we started looking at, um, uh, 
these um, twisted bilayographenes mm -hmm. at very small angles, they show some strange anisotropy effect. Um, even their drude weights are quite anisotropic. So as a theorist, to me, it's quite interesting because um, then um, and there are certain behaviors in the Casimir talk, uh, talk that might be possible um, that are not, uh, that you cannot get from sort of this kind of standard uh, torque behavior. But it's something that uh, I'm trying to, um, to work on the details, especially for the valve sentimentals for the torque. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I do not see any. Okay, we had a terrific group of talks this morning. We really got the workshop off to a wonderful start. I think all three talks were, were really uh, were really wonderful. So they set a high bar for the talks later on. So no pressure. Uh, uh, the talks were terrific.